everyone. Uh, my name is Tristiana Bigford. I'm the department's communications director. I am based out of Santa Fe and um, Jennifer normally takes the lead on um, getting these started, but she has been incredibly busy. And so I offered to, to take the lead on this one and, and kind of get us kicked off tonight. So um, I want to introduce the rest of our team here. Um, so Jennifer, I'll start with you and then Megan, Colleen, and then Elise will save you for last. Welcome everybody and happy new year. It's great to be back and great to have you all back. Um, this is gonna be a very informative um, discussion and session um, this evening, especially if the rulemaking process is, is very new to everybody and um, it can be a little complex sometimes. So, um, but definitely encourage questions and interactions. Um, and so I will pass the baton over to uh, Colleen. Good evening, everybody. Um, I've been coming on to these uh, webinars for, like Tristiana said, a couple of years now as a customer, but uh, now I am a new employee with the department. So I'm the public information specialist out of the Las Cruces office for the Southwest area. So pleased to be a part of the department and help these uh, great ladies on helping putting these uh, ladies hours on. So we're excited to have you guys here tonight. And um, certainly ask um, all the questions because tonight is a really good topic to get some of those answered. Thank you. We're excited good to evening, have you. Good evening, everybody. Oh, Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. My name is Megan Otero. I'm the assistant coordinator for Hunter Education and um, happy new year and welcome. And um, it should be a good topic. Yeah, I, I'm excited and um, like uh, Colleen, we're excited that you could you have joined us on staff officially, and <laughs> that you get to join us for all of these social hours now. So um, you'll become, I'm quite sure, one of the familiar faces and conversation holders. But um, Elise, I wanted you to introduce yourself um, and a little bit about your background, and you can explain why I chose this picture and, and sucking up to you a little bit. So <laughs> thanks, Tristana. And thanks for having me this evening. My name is Elise Goldstein, and I am the Assistant Chief of the Wildlife Section in our Wildlife Management Division. So it's my job to supervise all of our terrestrial wildlife biologists. So those are the biologists who work with um, all the animals who uh, live on the land as opposed to the ones in the water. And so I make sure that all of the research and the monitoring and the projects we do are relevant to our agency mission of conserving wildlife for future generations. Um, and a big piece of what I do right now is work on our rule development process, which we are about to talk about a lot more. So I've been in this job for about five years. And but I've been with the department for 20 years. So prior to this job, um, for about three years, I was the carnivore and small mammal program manager. But before that, I was the bighorn sheep biologist for about a dozen years. And so um, I'm not allowed to have a favorite animal, of course, but if I did, it might be bighorn sheep. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I was going to pick a different big horn sheep. So I used this one last year when we, or last week when we talked, but I don't know. I kind of like this picture. And so I just stuck with it and it, it, it gets me on your good side. So <laughs> absolutely. You're my favorite person right now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and for those of you that are just joining us, we are recording the session. So we will have it posted up on YouTube. Um, and please jump into the chat and let us know where you're from and who you are. Um, but tonight, I think, is one of a, a really important topic that we're gonna we're gonna cover, and um, I think the timing is absolutely perfect because tomorrow at 10 a.m. the big game draw opens, and um, as you guys know, the Game and Fish Department is is funded through the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and taxes on related equipment, and so the big game draw is our our largest um, money driver of the year, and. It helps us um, as a department figure out where we're going to go and how much money we have to spend on, on projects such as big orange sheep conservation and elk conservation and habitat work and fisheries work and um, all of these education programs that we do. So it, it's it's a huge time for us. And we really wanted to back up in the process and say, you know, how did we get to where we are here with the hunt um, choices that you currently have? And then I think the other part that makes this really um, an important time to have this conversation is that this year, um, at least, what do we say, eight rules? I think it's eight, and that could change <laughs> at any point. <laughs> so we will be opening up eight rules, and we're going to explain what that is here, because um, it's kind of a, an internal 
language that's really only important to Elise and drives what the rest of us know is the hunt structure. <laughs> um, but, but we have a whole bunch that we're going to be opening up starting in March, I believe. And so um, we really wanted to talk about that process and how to get involved and how that drives the hunt structures that are going to open up tomorrow um, so that everybody can apply. And um, I said it earlier, but we, we typically have a presentation and then questions and answers at the end. And we really wanted this to be a conversation all the way through. So if we start saying stuff like, hey, this rule, and this is how we're going to we're gonna go about it, and if there's questions or you need clarification, please raise your hand, shout, jump in the chat, and, and let us know so we can have a conversation about this. So at least I want to start at the very, the very basic and just what is a rule? Like, and why is that important? Right. So Game and Fish gets its authority to uh, work with wildlife from the legislature. So when the legislature makes laws, they're called statute. And that statute sets forth what animals we have authority to set hunting regulations on, amongst other things. So once we have authority by statute to do that, our game commission can then set um, laws. They're also laws. The game commission also sets laws about our hunting structure. And we refer to those as rules. So some of the things that we do, we do because it tells us in statute, we must do something a certain way. And so if we uh, don't like that, then the only way to change that is to go to the legislature and change the leg legislation. Um, however, much of what we do, we do because the Game Commission sets rule and it also um, is a, a law, but it's set not by the legislature, but by the State Game Commission. So the rules that are opening this year, they run for four years and then they expire, which means they don't exist after that. So if we don't go through this process, we don't have those rules. So these are the rules that set the game hunting season, which means if we don't go through this process, we will not have a rule or a law about game hunting, which means it will be illegal to hunt animals. And so clearly that is not our goal. <laughs> so that's why we're going um, through this process. And so we can set, um, we can set, um, things like how many hunts are there, how many licenses per hunt, what units are they going to be in, what weapon types are they going to be in, um, and those kinds of things that we can set during this cycle. Yeah, and I think that's that's huge because I, I know, um, you know, some people are like, well, I don't really care about what this rule is. I just want to go hunt elk. <laughs> and, and, and this is the time to get involved and say, you know, here's what I'm seeing on the ground. And, and here's how to have input into setting that rule so that it can help drive hunting structures in New Mexico and management structures in New Mexico into the years. So I, I, I think that's why it's so timely. And um, I feel like at least that you definitely, and then me a little bit have a, um, a little bit different look on it because we're so involved in this from behind the scenes and in trying to make sure everything everything gets put together. So um, I, I appreciate you being here to share that. But okay, so when we have these rules come into place, like it, to me, it thinks data data has to drive it. Science has to drive where we're going. So what kind of science do you and the other biologists in our wildlife management division? What do you guys take in and grab all these numbers to make an educated recommendation to the commission? Right, so the most important thing for me and my staff is to make sure that we're using like, the highest quality science that's out there. And so we are able to use some pretty high tech stuff, you know, with how amazing our computers are. We can do all kinds of statistics and crazy fancy stuff. Um, but, what we, but what that allows us to do is to take the, the data we collect on the ground and really learn as much as we possibly can from that data. So we do things, I mean, at the basics, we go out and we do surveys for these animals. And depending on the species, you know, some of the species were able to look at the total number of animals over time because it's an animal like a bighorn sheep where we can often get a really good, accurate count of those animals. Um, and so we can look at total population, we can look at trend, and we can um, find out what the most appropriate harvest level is for our management goals. Um, with an animal like elk, who tends to be in humongous groups in the middle of trees where you can't see them, it can be a lot harder. And so it's a huge challenge to get an actual total estimate. And so if you ever look at some of our data online, you'll see our estimate of the number of bighorn sheep in the state. It's pretty tight. Like we have a really good idea of how many there are. Elk is a whole other issue because 
you just can't get it. Like we don't have a technology that we that allows us to get an excellent count. So we really rely on some other metrics and some of the main ones um, um, have to do, we, we actually do get some, some total counts. And so but that's really only gonna tell us, I think if there's been big shifts, it can't really tell us if there've been small shifts. So we rely on some of the metrics like how many calves per 100 cows do we have? And so we can see if, you know, if there's aren't many very calves on the ground, maybe we should be worried or if there's lots and they're doing well, great. Um, we also look at the number of um, um, males per females to make sure we're keeping those ratios the way we want them to. And so that kind of information from our surveys is super important. Some of the results we get from that has actually dictated to us um, or suggested to us that we might want to get some additional information. We might even want to have a, a study or a research project. Maybe maybe we're seeing that our um, we're not getting a lot of calves surviving and we don't know why that is. So we actually have a research study. We might, we might um, get the universities involved to help us and get some graduate students on the ground. And then once we get the data back of what is going on here, like why is our population, you know, doing what we're observing, that can suggest management actions we can take to improve things. And it might suggest um, if we want to modify the hunt structure, maybe we want to have more or less or change the timing. And so all of that goes into the hunt recommendations for, for modifying these laws. And so that's the basis of it. But that's just the beginning. So to me, that's like building, like we're building a house here. So that's building the foundation. If your foundation is weak, if it's not based on good science, then whatever we implement later, the whole thing could collapse because it wasn't based on a good solid foundation. But there's there are other things that factor uh, into this rule. And, and Tristana, maybe um, you have some, some thoughts and can and set of, off in a direction to talk about some of those things because a lot of this stuff falls um, a little more into your shop than into mine. Well, and you know, the thing I was thinking next um, as you were talking, and one of the things I think is most important is the, the harvest report that we ask every hunter, and it's mandatory here, and it's not in other states, but we require every hunter to submit their harvest report because that really helps give us a more educated decision as we move forward. And, and I know you and the biologists look at that all the time. That's a really good point. And I was so wrapped up in like field work <laughs> that my mind was, I mean, I think I'm just looking at your bighorn sheep and your mountain. So I'm just thinking about being in the field, but, but that's a, a really excellent point because that, that hunter harvest report is actually really critical to what we do. So, um, after, as you, you ladies know, once you draw a license, you're gonna be required to report back. Did you harvest the animal? Did you go? Um, and there's a, a several other questions that you're asked and, and you may think that that's just an annoying thing you have to take care of. But I just wanna thank you for spending the time to do that because it's actually really, really important for us. Um, it really helps us key in again on where there might be some issues. It turns out that that hunter satisfaction rating tracks really closely closely with what the populations are doing. This is, was mystifying to me when I first heard this. I was like, that can't be right. But it kind of makes sense, right? If you go on a hunt and you don't see any animals, you're probably not going to be too excited. And why aren't you seeing any animals? That might tell us, okay, well, if we think there should be animals and you guys aren't seeing them and your satisfaction rating is low, there's something going on there that we could investigate further. But if we think that populations are doing well and satisfaction ratings are high, that suggests you're seeing lots of animals, you're having opportunities, you're happy, population's happy, that makes us happy. So, um, so that hunter satisfaction, you might think, oh, this is some strange Zen kumbaya thing, but no, no, not at all. It really, it's actually uh, really important for us um, and, and helps us a lot. And, and What's also really important is understanding what your, the success rate is, because if we offer, let's say we decide that it would be appropriate to, to harvest 100 animals, that's the right number. And so if we offer, um, you know, 100 and if we offer 100 tags, 100 licenses, and the success rate's 80 percent, that's 80 animals that that are going to be killed, and that's that would maybe be fine. We could perhaps increase the number of licenses a little more. But if the success rate is 30%, then perhaps we should be offering 300 licenses as opposed to 100. So those success rates are really important. Um, and the other, um, and as you know, there's more questions than that, but those are a couple that I'll touch on just because they're so kind of key for how we, how we set 
um, those recommendations for those rules. So, um, so thank you for taking the time to answer those questions and, and, um, and report that information to us because it's really quite important for, for setting an appropriate harvest season. And Colleen, I may have you jump in on this one as well, but I, I know at least you are, are known around the agency for saying that data drives the recommendation and that the science drives the recommendation. And I think that um, a piece of that that may not be as, um, you know, it is exact as a number uh, or a Dauphin ratio or an, a cow calf ratio, um, but that's the public involvement side and hunters calling and talking about how um, their experience went and what they saw and, uh, you know, in sharing that information um, and landowners and um, people that are they're out in the field regularly commenting and getting involved and Colleen, I'm going to call on you because I know your job has changed, but but I know that you have been very involved in that process in the past. And so um, if you guys will just talk a little bit about how people can get involved in that um, on many different levels, and then at least come back to you and talk about um, why that's so important, how you use that information that you get from hunters. So Colleen, do you wanna give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I can tell you guys from previous experience um, and from visiting not just with other groups and sportsmen, but also members of the game commission is they very much want to hear from the public. Um, getting that kind of feedback has been extremely useful and everyone that we've been able to work with um, over many years, especially during role development is always a set of open ears. Um, been very easy to work with um, as a department. You know, we want to hear the feedback from the public. Um, and it, it, like I said, it's a, it's a fairly easy process. You can do it in multiple different ways. You can send in comments via email once those rules are open or even to our general email. Um, and I'm sure maybe Tristana will, will correct me when I'm wrong of which ones need to go to certain places uh, for some of that rule process. But reaching out to all the commissioners also helps. If you have questions on maybe why we do things certain ways, um, Elise's team has always been fantastic to work with. Um, and especially on specific species, if you're not understanding maybe why there's so many deer licenses in a certain area or why can't we have more sheep licenses, you know, those are all driven because of certain things. Um, and they do a great job of explaining that, at least to, to me <laughs> in the past, it, it's made sense. Um, the other really important way that you can make your voice heard is by attending some of these commission meetings. Um, as these rules are gonna start opening up this year, throughout the year, there's gonna be different times and opportunities for sportsmen to attend those meetings, to make their voice heard um, and get some questions hopefully addressed also. But doing that early in that process is pretty key. And, and Elise might touch on that too, on how that timeline works for public comment, but the sooner that they can get that information, the better so that they can make the plan um, fit maybe some of those needs if possible. So um, from my past experience of attending commission meetings, the more sportsmen, honestly, that we can get there, the better. Uh, it's, it's open to anybody to attend. And um, sometimes we don't have a lot of people that show up. So it really is uh, something very important to get involved with because these rules are going to be set for the next four years. So it's not something that we as the public are able to get involved with um, each year. It, it comes in these cycles. And so it's good for the public to be sending in comments, touching base with uh, your local biologists and local game wardens and the department as well and with, with the commission meetings. So from, from my past life of getting involved with that, that's kind of the advice I would give is show up, let your voice be heard. Um, it does make a difference and it does matter. So I highly encourage people to, to come and attend and you get to come and hang out with us for a commission meeting. So that can't be so bad. <laughs> Bring snacks. That's what I was Bring talking snacks. about. Bring snacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elise, do you want to uh, maybe talk a little bit about that commission process and um, how people can provide pr provide that comment? Yeah. So as I mentioned, and Tristana has mentioned, um, science is the base of what we do, but science can't science can't dictate the management policy. It can just tell us what might happen if we change it. And so it might say, again, for example, 
it would be, if you wanna have a sustainable population, you can have a hundred licenses here, um, or you can harvest a hundred animals, but it can't tell us if 50 of those should be archery tags and the other 50 should be rifle, or if 10 of them should be youth only, or seven of them should be military, you know, military impaired. Um, it, it can't tell us that, or some of them should be once in a lifetime. So all of those things are, um, are really set up based on um, public desire and, and what the drive is for. And so that's what we really rely on you for, you know, do you want to have a hunt? Should we move it? A, can we move it a week earlier? Is that going to be um, more advantageous for the public or can we move it two months earlier? Um, those are the kinds of feedback that it's really important for us to hear because if we don't hear it, again, as long as from the biologist standpoint, as long as we're issuing that hundred licenses, for example, then, you know, from the bio biology standpoint, we're good. Um, and we have a structure in place already, so it seemed to be working, we'll continue with it. Um, if the public comes in and says, yeah, okay, it works fine, but we have some better way to do it, then why wouldn't we listen to you? Um, and although that was a rhetorical question, I'll in fact answer it. <laughs> um, so one of the things is you might imagine is challenging is if you're an avid archer and you just wanna go out and have lots of opportunity to shoot things with bows and arrows and that's what your friends do, then clearly you're gonna think that we should have some more archery opportunities because you'd like to have some more times when you can hunt without the rifle season going on and you'd probably like to have a higher number of licenses with that. Well, if you're an avid uh, rifle hunter and you're trying to get your kids involved, what you probably think we ought to do is have a whole lot more youth only rifle hunts. And then once your child has drawn that scrape that you and your buddies want to draw, also you, you think there should be less archery hunts and more rifle hunts. And I'm picking on archery and rifle hunters as an example, of course. But as you can see, if we get all that feedback, we can't maximize the number of youth rifle hunts, the number of rifle hunts, and the number of archery hunts because those things are opposed. So that means that sometimes people are going to give us their input and we're not going do what you asked us to, because we cannot do exactly what you asked us to for everyone all the time. And so really what our goal is, is to make sure that there are archery opportunities across the state and that there are rifle opportunities across the state and there are youth rifle opportunities across the state. So each sort of constituent, each interest has opportunities. Now it may not be as much as you want in the right place at the right time, but again, it's probably because there was a trade-off with another user group that wanted to have something also. So, so I just want to assure you that we really do listen to everything you tell us. Every comment that comes in, we read every single email, we consider everything that comes in, but it doesn't mean that we are going to implement everything because it's impossible, it's like physically impossible. <laughs> so, um, and again, I think as Colleen made a really great point, if there's ever anything that you're trying to, like, you don't understand why, like you really wanna go bighorn sheep hunting and yet there's just not a lot of ram licenses out there. And why is that when there's a very large number of elk licenses, why can't we increase the number of ram licenses? Cause you would really like to go and get one of those amazing trophy bighorn sheep and there's not a lot of opportunity and there should be. So, you know, if you have questions like that, then contact us because, you know, there are reasons behind it. Like we don't have nearly as many bighorn sheep in the state as we do elk. And we exclusively manage bighorn sheep for trophies, which means there's gonna be a smaller number of licenses. So, so perhaps those are things that you weren't aware of and that would make you know, some sense to you. And, and, um, and as an avid sportswoman, you should have that background. So, so get, please reach out to us and, and, and let us know what you're thinking. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I think it's so important to, to get involved in it. It may seem a little bit intimidating, but um, I, I can tell you, I can ask some really stupid questions and <laughs> everybody down in WMD takes it. And he's like, they're like, oh, you know, this is going to be okay. And they can answer my question. And, and I leave understanding it, it comes into um, blonde hair girl terms that I can like <laughs> really make sense of <laughs> and not, not just biologists. And they all have the, the time and the willingness to talk about that. And um, you know, I, I was thinking about Tony that runs our antelope program and, and he is so excited to talk about antelope with anybody at any time. He just loves to talk about it. And so if you go sit down and talk to him, it, it just, you kind of are like, oh, this makes more sense. And you learn more about the, pro the process. And so um, it's something that we can, we can definitely help connect people um, if you have specific questions. 
Um, but Elise, I want to talk a little bit about the process. So you guys have gathered this biological data, you've gathered the kind of the, the human element, um, some comments over the past four years, um, and kind of where you're at right now is to develop a recommendation, kind of a starting point to, um, to move forward through this process. So um, with the starting point, what happens next? Uh, so, so our first thing is to get sort of a broad set of recommendations. And so, for example, we might say, well, over in this area, we would actually like to decrease the number of licenses for deer, but maybe we haven't quite figured out how exactly we want to do that. Like, where are we going to make the cuts? Because um, we're still, we haven't gotten that far along with our public input. We just know sort of biologically, those numbers sort of need to decrease. So right now we're at the very beginning of this process. And so that's what we're thinking. We want maybe want to sort of decrease licenses here. Um, Maybe we want to, um, maybe there's an issue with, uh, with elk in a certain area where the population is really exploding and it's causing some problems and it's not an area that elk traditionally are in. And so maybe we want to actually increase the number of cow tags because that, um, that is a way to help to decrease populations if that's one of our goals. Um, but again, we're not really sure exactly how that's gonna work because life is complicated and we haven't had time to figure that out yet. Um, so that's where we are sort of right now is these sort of bigger ideas. We're having lots of discussions internally. Biologists are talking to each other. Um, we're talking with the game wardens. And so we're trying to merge the science from our research and monitoring with our local regional wildlife biologists and the game wardens who are on the ground who, you know, they're just eyes on the ground that, that, that we aren't necessarily doing from, from Santa Fe. So we're trying to merge what we're finding from our research and our monitoring and what they're seeing on a daily basis, um, seeing if that's lining up. If it's not lining up, there's probably a little more work to be done to try to figure out why isn't it lining up. Um, so we're still kind of, we're still analyzing some of the data. So we have to wait for all of the um, hunter harvest data to come in from last year. And then again, there's actually quite a bit of analysis that goes on. So we're continuing to assemble our data. Um, and then we also need to go out to have public meetings. And so I think we're gonna be starting to have those pretty soon. So this year we'll probably have those public meetings before the rule officially opens, but uh, it makes no difference. So it just makes sense in our timeline to get everybody involved early on. Um, and that's where we can, again, hear from you if we say, well, gosh, we really want to do population management and decrease the number of elk in this area. Um, that's where you can weigh in and say, I think this would be a great opportunity to have lots of youth hunts. So this would be a great opportunity to whatever it is that you think would be great. And that will have a really big influence on how we take the um, management goals we're trying to address and, and then how do we actually implement those. So our next steps at this point are, we're gonna go and have some formal public meetings. And I know you all are like, well, what about COVID? I mean, my crystal ball works just as well as all your guys' do, which is to say they were clearly <laughs> mass produced and useless. Um, so I don't know. I, we're talking about having some sort of combination potentially of in-person and uh, virtual, and at least it's set up that way. So if by the time we actually get to that meeting date, life has changed one way or the other, we can pivot and make it all in person, which seems unlikely, or all in virtual if that's what we need. Um, so yeah, we'll just have to see how it goes. But at those meetings, the biologists, they definitely make presentations and give you a lot more background about what the biology is, what they're seeing, what the harvest has been. Um, so they'll actually present that. So it's, um, it's more than just a lovely fireside conversation, um, but they'll present a lot more data and information to everyone. And then that's your opportunity to ask questions of the biologists as well um, and to give your input. So. So yeah, so that's kind of the next step. And so then when we open the meetings at the game commission meeting, we formally open them. We'll, we won't have a completely fleshed out proposal that says exactly everything, but we'll present what we have so far. And we really ought to be presenting all the topics we wanna to change at that point. So as we start moving down, once that rule is open and we start moving through the process, it gets um, a lot harder for us to introduce a brand new concept like we've decided to add seven more hunts <laughs> in this GMU for this species. Um, you know, that's probably not um, going to happen at that point because that's a big change. And we've already had a lot of public input and there just hasn't been time to vet that. So, so we wanna get those kind of big changes you know, earlier, earlier on. 
Um, so that's the next step. Uh, that's great. And um, I, I think that's important. So most of the rules go before the commission three times. Um, there, there can be some exceptions and they can end up going four or five times before the commission. But on average, they go three times before the commission. And so the first time it goes before the commission, they open the rule. And then what's the second time the, the rule goes before the commission? Right. So so after we've um, presented this sort of you know bigger picture, these are the big changes we want to make. Here's a few ideas. We continue getting public input, um, and so at the second meeting, uh, which will be, you know, the the timing is highly variable. So I think it it can be just a month later, but it could be two or three months later, and some of it just depends depends on game commission schedules. It depends on the fact that we don't want to run the process for all eight rules simultaneously because we can't keep up with it. <laughs> so some of them will just be on different timelines to give us an ability to do it. Um, and so it could be one month, two months, it could be a little longer, but probably not much. So when we get to the second game commission meeting, that's when we're gonna present something that's pretty concrete. Like this is our not quite, but almost finished recommendation. Like that should have like 90%. 85, 90% of what we want to do and how we want to do it. So it's not just that we want to um, increase this deer hunt by 100 licenses, but we're going to do it by increasing um, uh, 30 archery licenses and 20 youth only and 50 rifle. You know, like we want to be able to say that at that point. Um, but there could still be additional comments. Remember, the game commission meetings are public meetings also. And so there could be comments at the game commission meetings or things that the game commission is interested in, in seeing more of or less of that we haven't quite gotten there. You know, certainly we're in communication with the game commission, but if they've given, if given us a direction and they don't feel like we've quite achieved that, they may give us further direction on something. So we're getting down to the wire on changes. And so again, having like your very first comments come in at that second game commission meeting, it's getting late to make changes, you know, at that point, because we've already taken into account all the comments we've received. So to change then because of one comment gets harder if it's earlier with the general discussion, then I think we can respond to it better. So that's what happens at the second game commission meeting, still open for discussion, but getting a lot tighter with what the proposal was gonna be. And then after that one um, becomes a really important deadline. And you were talking earlier about um, that there's rules and laws that are set in statute. And one of those is the process that we have to go through. And I really don't want to bore everyone with that because that's your world. And um, yeah, it's quite boring. But there's, there's a deadline in there that essentially says that you filed that rule um, and I say you because you do most of the rules for the department, <laughs> you file that rule and, and there can't be changes for, for 30 days. Is that, do I have that correct? Yeah, yeah. So what Tristan is referring to, and I'm sorry, if you all fall asleep in the next 10 seconds, I apologize. I have to say this much about it. <laughs> so the legislature did pass a statute. Oof. I think it was about four years ago because the last time we went through the rule cycle was the first time we were under it. And we affectionately refer to it as the rule about rule making. And so it sets out pretty prescriptive exactly how we have to go through the process of rulemaking. And in some cases, there's actually like timelines and there has to be a 30 day window here and two weeks there and you have to do this. And if you don't do it, we've actually violated the law. So yeah, a big part of my job with these rules is to make sure we don't violate the law. So there's no pressure. I mean, I'm a wildlife biologist, not a lawyer, but no pressure. <laughs> um, and so the good news is the law is not too confusing. It is. Um, so, so what, what Tristan is referring to is that um, at the third game commission meeting is when they're gonna vote as to whether or not they're going to approve it. And you might hear the word hearing. So it's actually a hearing where they vote to approve it or not to approve it. And at that point, they can either approve the entire law or none of it. So they can't make changes to anything. It's set, they can approve everything that was recommended or nothing. And then, um, so we need to get to the point where they'll approve all of it because again, if they don't, we have a problem. <laughs> so, um, so we don't want that. Um, so, right, so 30 days prior to the hearing where they approve or not, um, our recommend, the department's recommendation, 
30 days prior to that, we have to make public all of our final recommendations. So we're gonna post on our website, all of like a summary that's written hopefully in coherent English of what we're gonna do. So it's kind of easy for you to just read through these kind of bullet pointed things that we're proposing. We also have two copies of the law itself. One of them is the law that we have right now that's in place. And then we strike through the text that we're gonna delete. And then we underline the text we're gonna put in its place and we highlight it and we highlight new text. So it's a way you can see what we have and exactly what changes we're gonna to make to it. And then we have another copy where all that's incorporated and it's nice and clean and it's less confusing to look at, but you can't track the changes we're proposing. So all of those have to be on our website and they have to be there minimum of 30 days in advance. And we can't change a thing once it's posted, nothing. Now, I suppose if I misspelled something for which I would never hear the end of it if I misspelled something, um, but if I did, I could correct that. <laughs> I can do like minor typographical kinds of things. But if we wanted to propose a new hunt or change the number of licenses, something of substance, not allowed. If it's decided to do that, we actually have to back up in our process so we could make those changes. And we, at a minimum, would have to start a new 30-day uh, window. But that's assuming that whatever change we made has already gone through the public process and all of that. We may have to back up months in our process. So really, um, our goal is to, to get to that 30-day window and have everything just set. And so, so that's the plan, and that's what should transpire. So. Um, Again, I, you know, it's, they call it a 30 day public comment period, but truly at that point, that's all it is, is you expressing your opinions, but we can't do anything with them at that point. <laughs> so it always seemed a little silly to me. They would have a 30 day public comment period when you can't use that comment to direct anything, but that's why we get you involved now, because now you have lots of time to give your comments and help direct uh, where we go. So, right, so following, so again, how much time is between commission meeting number two and number three? I don't know. It depends on which rule we're talking about. It's all different. Um, as you can see, there would be a minimum of 30 days, because we have to have that 30-day window. And occasionally, we in fact have 30 days. <laughs> so that makes things a little tight. Um, but we often have more like two months. Again, it just depends on the schedules of uh, um, on how things fall. So, um, so that's sort of how it goes. And you can see how things like right now, we want to hear everything that's on your mind. And then once we open it, we're going to narrow it some. And then once we get to that second commission meeting, it gets narrower still. And then once it gets that 30 day posting, I think we're done. We're set. So you can come to the, the, the final game commission meeting where they're going to vote, approve it. And you can tell us that you love it or you hate it or you have this brilliant idea that you just had last night. But at that point, we can't, we definitely, you know, we still can't change anything. So we would love to have your brilliant ideas. And I would say if you have a brilliant idea, let us know because because while we would prefer to have it now, um, that's great. <laughs> but if we don't get it before that 30 day window or before a final um, the final vote is taken on the rule hearing, there's always the ability for us to incorporate it over the next four years and, and put it into the next rule cycle. So, you know, for short term, the sooner the better, but never stop giving that feedback because it's definitely something to build upon. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, Elise, and, and it may be backing up um, just a little bit is, I think when we look at the public input process, um, there, there's so many ways to do it. And, um, you know, you can, Get involved in the rulemaking process and there's a very specific email that you can send all of those those comments to and we will put that out when we put out the press release with um you know here's a link to the proposal under consideration and jennifer posted that link um in the chat so you could grab that chat and see the rules that are open now um there's only one open now but soon there will be more but that's where you can get all the information um you can get the meeting dates uh for the public meeting process and you can get that email address and so you can email all your comments to them um, to that email address and the biologist look at that very frequently in, in the rulemaking process. And then, you know, you can you can call and talk to our biologists. All of the officers are uh, all of our officers and all of our biologists phone numbers are on the Game and Fish website, as are Jennifer, me, Megan, Colleen, and Elise. We're all listed on there as well. And, and so it's great that you can reach out. And of course, if you you do just want to email us, we can help connect you. But I think our sportsmen's organizations are a huge link in there and, and they are talking to the department 
constantly. <laughs> and so getting involved in those sportsmen's organization, whether in whatever your favorite is, whether you know it's the Mule Deer Foundation or the Mount Elk Foundation, the, Big, the Wild Sheep Foundation, um, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the Wildlife Federation, that there's so many, but at least I know you guys um, and you and your boss are, are talking to them constantly and helping to bring in that information to make an, a better educated decision. Right, that's correct. You know, the, the uh, sportsmen groups obviously are representing um, a large number of people. And what's great is they are able to reach out to their memberships as well. And so in previous rulemaking processes that I've been involved with, you know, there have been questions that were kind of like a big deal, but we weren't necessarily getting the input we needed. And so I was able to work with some of those um, sportsmen and women group and say, what does your membership want here? Like, I don't care which way we go. This is absolutely about, um, you know, either direction or any of these three choices are going to work fine biologically. I feel like there's a lot of, like, this is a big deal, but I'm not getting a direction. Can you reach out to your membership? And so they do. And then they're able to come back to me and say, okay, this is what, what we're hearing. And that's really helpful to us. And so because of the fact that those um, organizations have large memberships, we do um, often meet with you know, the presidents um, of those organizations one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So we just have separate meetings with them. And so it's a really good way for them to summarize what membership is hearing or let us know if there isn't a nice summary. I mean, I, again, I wish I could tell you that hunters in general feel this way, but they don't. Every hunter feels a different way. And there are many, many thousands of them. It is very complicated. And so one thing that actually is helpful with these, with this um, sportsman's groups is they can sort of synthesize, like if there's a general feeling, like generally speaking, folks want this. There's a couple of people who are very vocal, who want something different. They're not really representing maybe the majority. And that's helpful to us because we don't know the membership the way these groups do. So, um, so we have the opportunity to talk to them directly. Um, we're already having conversations with the biologists. We're going to be setting, uh, between them and the biologists, we're going to be setting up you know, more formal meetings with the wildlife chief, who's my supervisor, to meet with them. So that's a great way to get your voice heard as well. Um, I know not everybody's comfortable standing up in front of a game commission meeting and making comments. So this is a great way that, you know, you can interact at maybe in a different environment and, um, and you can also learn more about what other people, um, what other folks from the membership are saying. And um, sometimes, you know, people who make comments at public meetings, you just never know if their opinion is um, supported by lots of other people or just themselves. And so I think getting involved with those sportsman's groups will really help you um, get a feeling for some of the issues that are important to, to other sportsmen and women and, and what direction they're looking to go. Um, and I think that's a great way to get involved. Yeah, I agree. And, and I do think that standing up in front of a commission meeting is is quite intimidating and you know <laughs> getting the correct terminology is um i think it's definitely intimidating and we have all of our past game commission meetings on the website so you could always watch them or um you know call somebody um like colleen who has presented at a lot of commission <laughs> meetings and, and i'm sure she could give you some advice as to you know this is how you're going to address the commission this is a great way to keep your your comments concise because they uh, at the last meetings, they were only giving three minutes to talk. And so you have to be clear and concise about what you want. Um, and so she she might be a good one to to give you a couple of, of, of helpful tips uh, to, to address the commission. Um, and so at least you had mentioned that this year we have eight rules um, in and this is specific to the wildlife management division, because if you look at that link that Jennifer shared with the proposals under consideration, and there's one that's currently there that's the revocation rule. Um, that one has had recommendations that have gone to the commission. The rule has been open. They held some public meetings. Um, and so now they're, they're kind of in that spot where that's narrowing down and getting um, closer to the, the second hearing and, and hopefully a final rule, rule hearing in the next few months. Um, but you can, see, you can see that information that's up on the website now. So from the wildlife management side, um, what are the rules that are open this year or, or that we're expecting to open this year? Okay, let's see if I can remember them all. <laughs> um, we have bighorn sheep, javelina, pronghorn, we're going to have turkey, deer, elk, exotics, oh gosh, someone's going to hate me because I'm missing them, 
in the exotics has um, Oryx, Barbary, and Ibex. All three are listed in that room. Correct. Role. They're all together in one. What big game animal? Oh gosh. Help me out. I can't think of it, the eighth one. So just <laughs> there's an eighth one somewhere. Javelina? Is it Javelina? We said how I think we said Javelina. Oh. Maybe there was only seven and I'm remembering wrong. There's sometimes we have issues where if we change something in a species rule, there may be an additional rule that actually has to get changed too because they reference each other, if that makes sense. So maybe the eighth one was just one of those sort of I'll say housekeeping rules where not that the, the, the other rule is a housekeeping, but the, the reason we have to open it is just to get it to match suddenly. So we've actually been putting some effort recently into making information live only in one rule, because as you might imagine, it gets really crazy when it lives in multiple rules and one rule opens and the other doesn't, and oh my heavens. So we're trying to change that, but um, some of it is still just a little bit, of, it's always a work in progress. So, so I already know of one other rule that has to change because of that. So maybe that's what I'm thinking, but if I Come up with another critter. I'll let you know. <laughs> is it bear by chance? No. So bear and cougar um, is something that we will actually do one year from now. So those that that one tends to be a big rule that gets uh, a lot of involvement. And so just to, already doing as many rules as we are in one year is just like a big workload for us. And so we're just we're trying to space a few things out a little bit. So bear and cougar will be a year from now that we'll be doing that. Yeah. So not that one. And I should have this list at my fingertips, but you know, I don't. So actually I have it electronically. So why we're talking, I'll also just try to call up some extra information because I'm feeling silly for not remembering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, and I think I think it's a, a big year um, and, and all of those rules are not gonna open at one time. And ha so- I have it, sorry. <laughs> I'm having a eureka moment. Migratory bird. And the reason I, I probably wasn't thinking about it is migratory bird is a little bit special in that it actually opens every single year. So here's one where anytime you have a phenomenal idea about migratory bird, you should share it because the rules either open or about to be. So, um, so you can always take your migratory bird comments. Yeah, I yeah should have realized that one. <laughs> um, so I forgot, forgot where I was headed, but um, well, oh, with the four-year rule cycle, um, can you talk a little bit about why there's that four-year time frame, um, as opposed to like the migratory bird that opens every year? Uh, why is it important to have that four-year process? And can can the, the the hunt structure and the information that is in that rule can it change in that four-year timeline? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. So the reason we like four years is we're gonna go right back to where we started at the beginning of this talk is because everything's based on science. And um, typically things take a little bit of time to change on the ground. So if we, um, let's just go back to the example where we decided that we would like to have a management goal of reducing the number of elk in a certain area. And so we increased the number of cow licenses. Um, did it work? Well, I mean, I suppose it could work in one year, <laughs> but it's more likely that you want to take several years to see um, what the impacts of that change on the ground are. And, and because these animals, you know, they're slow to reproduce, they typically just have, you know, a lot of these ungulates just have one baby a year, you know, in some cases two. It's not like there's mice though that have, you know, just children all the darn time and you could have a change really fast um, to some change in your harvest. You know, it's going to be slow. So we want to give that time. Um, and we want to, so we want to, and we also want to look at trends. So if we changed something, let's say we increased our licenses, did the numbers like go down a lot and a lot and a lot. And after four years, we're like, whoa, that went down a lot. <laughs> like, whoa. Um, or is it just going down a little bit? Or did it go down just a little and then got stable? So what, what we want is a trend. We want a pattern to see what's happening. And that four years, I mean, I'll be honest, there's nothing truly magic about that. But that was just kind of a, a time that we felt like that's enough time biologically to have those animals and those populations elicit a response to the change in how we're um, to, to changing numbers of licenses. And so we can see if we are achieving our management objectives or not. Um, that's where four years comes from. You know, anything shorter, we don't really get much of a trend. You start getting longer and well, life does change on the ground and we wanna be able to have flexibility to respond. Um, the reason migratory bird opens every year is not really biological. It's the fact that um, by definition, these migratory birds 
move all across, you know, from north to south and north in, in, in um, the United States. And so what you don't want is for North Dakota to say, well, ha, we've got tons of birds, so we're just going to harvest as many as we want because there's plenty. And then by the time they get to New Mexico, there's no hunter opportunity left. So migratory birds are managed jointly throughout all the states and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, so we're all so it's kind of a different process. And so, at least at the beginning, it's a different process. And so, so we have to get together, and they just um, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service leads that process, and they've decided that they want to do it a lot more frequently. They want to have that very fine tune ability to to shift every year. And so, it's pretty different. Um, I think the longer process just makes so much more sense. Um, because again, I, you know, year to year, you don't see much change and to go back and forth by one or two, like all the time, just to make some sort of change, I, you know, it doesn't really um, make a big impact on the ground. So, so that's why you have four years. That's a long answer. Um, so for those of you who are like nervous about reaching out to biologists that we might be mean, like, as you can see, we just love to talk about wildlife and it's hard to actually get to get us to be quiet. <laughs> So you no reason to be shy about reaching out. I just Daniel will tell you, I went to get a two minute answer. It's a half an hour later. Can I leave your office, please? So, um, but the question about um, can we change things midstream? The answer is yes, we can. However, we have to go through the entire rulemaking process again in order to change something. So we have to have the public involvement. We have to have the multiple game commission meetings. We have to follow. There's all kinds of of paperwork and filing things that, that I promised I won't talk about um, that has to happen too. So, so we can, you know, if it's important that we do it, we can do it. But because it's a pretty, you know, big undertaking, we would only do it, we would only open the rule if it were truly something that couldn't wait. Um, however, for smaller changes, there is some latitude on most of the rules. Our director has the authority to make adjustments to the number of licenses plus or minus 20%. Now he can't just create new youth hunts. He can't just shift, um, he can't start shifting um, some of those other things. It's his, his authority really talks to the number of licenses, but it allows us to address May, our, our ability to meet management goals. So if we've seen a population decline in an area and we think that it would be not in that population's best interest to continue offering as many licenses as we have, he has the authority in many cases to decrease that, that by up to, to 20%. And likewise, if the population suddenly like skyrockets and suddenly there's this fantastic opportunity to get some more hunters on the ground, then he has that ability to go up to 20%. It's different species by species, so there's some variation there. But but with so so within that, there is some ability to address smaller problems. But the bigger ones, again, we typically are waiting for the next four-year cycle to deal with them. Um, although if it's quite important that we open the rule, then we will open the rule and we will do what it takes. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to remember um, that when we have these rule setting processes, and so. Um, like Elise mentioned, the eight rules that we're going to be looking at in 2022, those will go into effect officially April 1st, 2023, um, but they will be listed in the rules and information booklet before that. And so, you know, that's part of why the timeline is so important is because we have to get that rules and information booklet out so that you all can make an educated decision um, and pick your hunt codes and, and choose which hunt you, hunt you want to apply for. Um, but when those rules change, really keep an eye on those hunt codes because there can be some significant changes to hunt codes. And I know that the last time the rule changed, I had hunters calling in that were saying, oh my gosh, I applied for this hunt. This is not what it was. And we said, well, you know, that was the old hunt code, but now we have this new hunt code. <laughs> and so it's really important when these rule cycles happen in, in really every year to double check those hunt codes and make sure you're applying for, for what you, what you want to be applying for. But um, I, I know Elise and I have talked quite a bit and we've covered a whole lot of ground that um, I really geek out in because I, I find it interesting how these whole processes work. But um, I want to open it up and see, you know, if anybody has any um, questions, um, Megan, Colleen, Jennifer, do you guys have anything to add that we've missed or um, to, to add to the conversation? So please feel free, raise your hand, unmute yourself. Let's hear from you. Go ahead. I just want to add how important it is for people to get involved and I do talk to you know folks on whether in person or over the phone, 
and they think, oh, I, I just don't think my idea has any substance or my concern has any substance and it's probably just me, by all means, if you're thinking it, there's a lot of other hunters in the community that are probably feeling it and they're just not being courageous enough to step up and, and give comment. And so uh, submit your comments, um, just do that. Help, help us do what's best for sportsmen in New Mexico to have good experiences, quality experiences, but we can't really do that unless we do hear from, from you all that are out there in the field, um, whether your hunt was great, whether it was terrible, um, you know, th those are things that are, that are very, very important. And so fire away at us um, so we know where you as sportsmen are coming from. I'll just <clears throat> echo on to what Jennifer said there too is, it is extremely important to get involved, um, especially with current tone of the hunting community across the United States um, and different groups trying to change things too. It's important for hunters to make their voices heard. However, that comes with a little caveat of there is the proper way to do it. Um, making sure to send those comments into um, the right email addresses when those rules open and they'll be specific to that rule. So a deer email and an elk email or et cetera. Um, blasting opinions or changes or something on social media doesn't help. <laughs> um, those, those comments and feedback doesn't get put into the right hands. So if you guys really do have genuine concerns or questions um, that would really help Elise's team and, and our department, send those straight to the department um, and be very supportive and, and maybe not as critical. If you come with a criticism on it, help us with a solution. Let us know on how that is gonna help and, and how it would help you as a hunter. So um, just wanted to add that real quick. I would say my biggest tip is <clears throat> we hear a lot from people that say, I didn't know about this or when did that happen? Um, I never got a chance. If you don't, when in your customer accounts, if you don't opt in to receive emails from us or communication from us, that's how we send out these, these public releases. That's how we let people know the rules about to open here's when the meeting, you know, game commission meeting is, here's when public hearings are. Um, if you're not opt in to receive that information from us, unless you're keeping like really on it, looking at our website all the time, you might miss that boat. So I would definitely recommend that you, you opt in to get communication from us. Um, sometimes it can be a lot. I mean, we have eight rules coming up. We're going to be sending out lots of public releases. Um, so it can get to a point where you just start like, going, oh, it's another email from Game and & Fish and, and delete. And, and then you find out later on that that email or that communication from us was, hey, there's a public meeting, you know, happening next week, you know, here in, in this town or, you know, at this time, whatever it is. So if you if you don't opt in for that communication, you're gonna you might miss the boat on when we need to hear from you. Um, so I guess my my biggest um, advice would be is is make sure you're opting in to get that communication from us and, and kind of keeping an eye on on what those emails say because a lot of it has a lot of important dates and information. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Megan. <laughs> I should have thought of that one, but that is a, a very great point and. And as you're talking, I was thinking as one of the, the other ways to get involved, you know, throughout the four years and, and you know, even now is to talk to your local officer because um, they are working really closely with Elise. And I know that you and your team have gone out of your way to make opportunities to have those conversations with them, um, with our officers and to, to share the information that they're getting from, from on the ground. So, so please, yes, please opt into emails. Please talk to a biologist to, to the officers, um, call us. I am, am not a great mid, middle person to like translate your ideas, but I will put you in contact with somebody who can, I couldn't understand and have a good conversation with it about you, about the idea that you have with you. Um, so at least I'm not seeing a lot of questions, which we can still take them. But um, the thing I hear most frequently when I bring up any kind of public input process, and, and you kind of touched on this, but I'm going to bring it back because I think it's so important is that, uh, you know, I hear people say very frequently, you know, well, I talk to the department, but they don't listen. 
Um, and I, I know that you do listen. So <laughs> please talk on that again for a minute and, and, and you know, talk about how it's important to get, get there and, and how you do everything you can to balance as many opinions as you get. <laughs> right, right. So, so we really do listen. Um, again, um, I think we've, uh, we've mentioned this evening that there'll be a different email address for each one of the uh, different species rules. And so there is a biologist who is in charge of each one of those, and it is their job to summarize the comments they're getting, um, and then um, to talk to me and to talk to our boss and the director um, about the ideas that we're getting. And so we really do listen. Um, but again, we, we actually can't, it is physically impossible, to, even if we wanted to incorporate everybody's comments and uh, nothing else mattered except exactly what public comment was. We couldn't because again, we're going to get like complete opposite. And you can imagine that that's true because people have different goals, right? So some, there could be people who don't want a lot of elk in an area if that's, you know, in conflict with what they want to do. And so they're going to want to have a lot more hunts, you know, a lot more cow hunts. They, they, they just want those we don't want the elk there. There maybe it's a problem with crops, or they're just causing a nuisance, or there's a lot of accidents on the highways. They don't want them there. Whereas other people think this is super exciting that the elk are expanding into this area. We really want to protect them. We want to promote them. We don't want to have a lot of hunts. So we can't do both, <laughs> right? We can't do both. Um, so sometimes there's a middle ground to be had. Perhaps not in that particular situation, but sometimes there is. But sometimes it's going to be more about saying, okay, well we're going to set aside these areas to promote elk growth. And we're gonna set aside those areas not to promote elk growth. Um, another example could be, maybe you just wanna go hunting. You don't care about getting a trophy bull. That is, I mean, that would be lovely, right? But that's not what like motivates you. What you really want is have an opportunity to go camping and to go hiking and to try that fantastic new gear you bought from Cabela's. And you wanna get out with your friends and your family and just have the experience. And you, want, you would love to get something especially if it's just like rep a representative animal. But in the end, if you don't, that's okay too, because you really just wanted to go. But other folks have no use for that. <laughs> they just want the biggest bull on the mountain. And if they don't have an opportunity to go get the biggest bull, they're not interested. They don't have time to just do those scouting on their own and to go like, they don't have time for all that. So they just want to go get a big animal. And if that's not going to happen, they don't want to go. So we separate things out where we have our our hunts where we manage for opportunity. There's probably gonna be more people out there. There's probably gonna be fewer trophy animals. You might have less of a chance of even getting into groups of animals, but you have a lot better chance of drawing that tag. On the other hand, we have areas where we don't have a lot of tags, you know? So the hunt is awesome. You might like, you're not gonna see a lot of people. There's gonna be huge animals out there that you may put in for that draw every year and never actually draw it. <laughs> so. So that's a way that we, and you might say, well, this area, I want to go. I want to have more tags so I, so I can draw that area. But if we start increasing the number of licenses, it's gonna change the experience altogether. There'll be fewer trophy animals out there. There'll be more people on the mountain. Suddenly we're not managing for that. So ultimately there will be areas where we manage for trophy, areas where we manage for opportunity. Um, you can use our draw statistics, which maybe Tristan will talk about a little more to help you understand where those are. Because I do hear from people, well, I've been putting in forever and I never draw and they tell me where they're putting in. I'm like, well, yeah, have you seen it? Statistically speaking, you will never draw there unless you can live to be 307 years old. <laughs> so, um, so you can use the draw odds to let you know if, if you just want opportunity, don't don't apply in those areas. It's really hard to draw, you know, go somewhere else um, and vice versa. So maybe Tristina can talk more about that. But, but just to wrap up with this is just to say like we ultimately, we're looking on a statewide level to provide opportunities for all user groups at some point. And again, we can't always do it exactly where you want to, but there's a lot, I mean, I can point to a lot of examples where someone came and had an idea and I've been like, what are you even explaining to me? Like, you need to back up because this is crazy. And then they explain it. And they're like, huh, that actually is a fantastic idea. Like, I should have, I really should have thought of that. They paid money, me money to think of these things and they didn't. And then we ended up incorporating it because it really was just a great, you know, a great opportunity and made so much sense. And so we can incorporate them. So, so again, listening to you and going that direction, we 
can't always do both. And again, it also means, you know, we have also have to go right back to the biology too. You know, if you want, if you want to do something that's going to start not meeting the management objectives for those herds, then, you know, we probably don't want to go there either. So there's a lot that goes into it, which I hope, I hope if anything in the last hour, that's a takeaway message is that there's a lot of people and a lot of processes and there's biologies and there's biology and there's, you know, hunter satisfaction and there's harvest success rates and there's management objectives and what gets put into this big pot and, um, and all the ingredients are important though. And, and you guys are, who are listening here are a really important part of it. Absolutely. And one thing I just wanted to just say real quickly, Christiana, because you had mentioned the rules and information book, and of course everyone's familiar with that, but I just want to um, draw the line and make that connection between the rules and the rules and information book. And so the RIB, the rule and information book, that we call the RIB, um, that's really just a summary of the, the important parts and the parts that like hunters really just need to know that are in the rule. But we also bring more into that rules and information book, things that are not in our rules, but that you need to know in order to be um, successful with your hunt and to be able to follow the laws. And so we do bring in, for example, there's a lot of information about what you can and can't do on military properties. That's not our rules, but you're gonna be out there hunting on the military and you're gonna be looking at this book. So it makes lots of sense for us to put that information there. So it's accessible to you. So much of what's in there is what the rule is, but then there's also just a lot of inf additional information um, because it's sort of all in one place that's gonna be helpful for you as a hunter. So I just wanted to kind of make that connection between our rules and what's in that rule and information book. Yeah, but I think that that's a great point. Very, very important. But um, we did have one question about the draw odds and Jennifer did say we're gonna talk about that in February, which um, it, we're hoping that February can build on this conversation. And I know Jennifer and Colleen, you guys are working on that. Do you wanna talk about February and um, what all is gonna be talked about? And what are we, who are we gonna have? Or do you know yet? <laughs> so for February's topic, which is, this is an awesome segue to reel you all in to <laughs> February social hour. Um, but uh, Colleen and I are gonna collaborate on helping everybody understand how to apply, um, how to interpret and, and explain as to the best of our ability how to read those draw odds and stats because it can be a really um, resourceful place um, if you are trying to decide what hunts you're going to put in for, what type of experience you, you're wanting, um, whether you're a seasoned hunter or maybe you are brand new to the hunting world and what kind of experience are you looking for. So those that all of that is what we're going to discuss next time. And then of course, giving you pointers on exactly how to apply what you need to apply um, and just kind of go through that process of um, just the whole gamut. So Colleen, anything you'd like to add there? No, I'm, I'm actually super excited for our February one because I kind of geek out too during draw applications. Actually, Jen and I were talking about this right before we were getting ready to start tonight of, do you have your own codes picked out yet? And, you know, it's always something of, you know, you wait until the last minute to maybe change or tweak something. And so we'll definitely go over on if you're like us and undecisive on how to maybe change something once you've already applied, you know, um, and we'll, we'll definitely address your question, Sue, on how we can maybe read some of those draw odds um, because it can be super overwhelming kind of reading that report for the first time if you're not sure what to look for. So we will be um, super excited to go through it with you guys and hopefully make it make sense for you because it can be quite a big task. And um, so something maybe for you guys to think about before coming to um, the next lady session is what maybe some of your goals might be. Do you want to just have an opportunity to draw a tag? Are you looking at maybe trying a new species for the first time? Um, are you hunting for the first time? Are you going to have a support system? Um, th those kind of big things will help you plan out what kind of um, hunts you're going to be applying for, what weapon type you need to be deciding, what your schedule might look like. That plays into a big factor with a lot of us. Um, and what kind of experience you're trying to get out of your hunting season. So. We will certainly help you kind of guide through that and kind of give you our insight and process on what we do when we apply for hunts. 
Yeah, the other thing I want to add to that too is uh, a lot, I think this is part of our conversation last year is uh, a lot of folks want to apply with somebody else and some that can be a little daunting that process. So we are going to cover that as well. I'm excited. Do either of you have that date right off the top of your head? Ooh. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, first Tuesday let me pull month? up my calendar <laughs> <laughs> for the first can... Tuesday of the month right uh it's the third. oh shoot oh the Megan, third what, Megan while they're looking at dates do you I know you're working on March's lady social hour and, and what do you have going on there so for March we will be bringing back a crowd favorite um we'll have uh, Helen here again like we did last year to do a round two of spring turkey um, questions. And uh, we had her last spring and um, I think it was one of our longer social hours. Uh, There's lots of questions and lots of tips. And so we're, we'll be doing round two with her. And um, I believe that one is going to be February, not February, March, I think 22nd is when that one is. So we will. We'll definitely get get more information out in the registration links. Um, but I also want to mention that we have the um, a whole series that we're doing um, through Zoom and uh, broadcasting them live on Facebook and talking about um, tips and information to help apply for this year's drop. And so, um, you know, I, I want to encourage everybody to check those out. Um, all of the big game biologists um, will be joining us to talk about elk, and we're going to talk about access. We're going to talk about oh my goodness harvest reports, I, I, the whole nine yards. <laughs> we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff. So um, feel free to, to jump in and check out those. Those are listed on the Game and Fish Department's um, uh, events pages as well. Um, but at least I want to thank you. I know that you are incredibly busy getting public meetings set up and getting rules <laughs> scheduled. And, and um, so I appreciate that when I came and said, I think we need to talk about this because I think it's really important. And you volunteered to give up a couple of nights to have this conversation. <laughs> and so I really appreciate that. You bet. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And appreciate everyone who's uh, come in to attend, to attend on a topic that is not nearly as interesting as talking about um, spring turkey hunting, for example, but I appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy schedules to come listen to what I had to say. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, with that, I think Jennifer has some contact information up there for Elise and for all of us. And um, please send us your thoughts and ideas on what you guys want to hear so we can start looking at April and on for Lady Social Hours. But um, thank you all. And I hope everybody has a great evening.